The King is coming. Why isn't everyone excited about it? And I think a lot of the reason people don't fight is because we've been taught there's no need to. You're going to be raptured out of here. We're going to be rescued. And uh, so this place is going to burn up anyway. And so that's generally what people believe. Now, you know, they may not use those words, but deep down inside, that is what they've been taught. And that's what they believe. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan spends the hour with two guests, Pastor Mark Henry and Mondo Gonzalez. We live in the generation that the prophets of old longed to see, yet very few people seem to care. And the pulpits are silent about this topic. We won't be silent. Here is today's uninterrupted program. So verse 35, Luke 21, he says, For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the earth. Wow, whatever's coming is going to affect everybody on the earth. Could anybody be exempt from that, Paul, or could any, or Luke, or Jesus, or what's going on here? Verse 36, Be always on the watch and pray that you may escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. In the midst of all of the foreboding, horrific things that are going to come upon the earth dwellers during the seven-year tribulation period, there is a parenthetical insert by Jesus himself saying, Hey, I'm paraphrasing right now. Hey, you guys, what I said in Luke 21, 36, didn't I say it in John 14, verses 1 to 3? You're going to get out of here before the entire world is engulfed in my coming judgment, in my coming wrath upon the earth during the tribulation period. Titus 2, 13, we are there admonished to be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice you're supposed to be looking for the coming of the Messiah, not the anti-Messiah. For Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. The believer today, right now, as we do this podcast, you are to be looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. You say, well, Jack, we're seeing all kinds of things about a global government, global religion, global currency, a digital currency. We're, we're, here, we're hearing about all these things regarding uh, DARPA developing uh, these subcutaneous uh, invisible or visible, whatever you want. You want it to look like a tattoo or not, but a, a, a system by which you are electronically able to deduct money from your account, go shopping at a store, uh, walk around this world, having your heart rate, your blood pressure, everything recorded back to your physician or on your app. Um, we're living in days that are so indicative of what the end time speaks about. That's right. How close are we then? The rapture could happen today. Well, thank you, Pastor Jack Hibbs, for summing up an important topic in just two minutes that sort of sets the stage for this hour. And we have a one-night Understanding the Times conference coming up here on Thursday, February the 22nd, just outside of Minneapolis. Our guest will be Mondo Gonzalez. Pastor Mark Henry and I serve as co-hosts. I'm going to talk to both of them this hour. And this is our third year featuring these events here in the Twin Cities area. We live stream them free to the whole world and post them to our website, to YouTube, Rumble, his channel, and other places within about a day or two following. So I'm going to be joined by these two guests in just a moment, but I want to first make a comment about a new book we are carrying. I referenced it last week with Pastor Gary Hamrick. It's Bible Prophecy Under Siege, Responding Biblically to the Confusion About the End Times, Dr. Ron Rhodes. Well, Ron is not able to be on air with me this week or even in the near future. Still, I wanted to address this book, and so I'm going to get into some topics in the book, again, with my guests here for the hour. And again, Bible prophecy under siege? Really? Well, I think so, based on the number of emails, letters, and calls we get here at Olive Tree Ministries. There's a lack of understanding about the topic, a lack of interest in it. There's an abuse of the topic, mocking it. There's a rudeness that this topic seems to instill in some people, rampant disinterest, as I've said. There's many false theologies in this realm of theology. 
So we're going to look at some of those here in the next hour. Our guest, again, Mondo Gonzalez, is the author of the rather new book, The Red Heifer Ritual, The Last Piece of the Third Temple Puzzle. And he is the co-host of Prophecy Watchers Radio and TV, along with Gary Stearman, Pastor Mark Henry, lead pastor at Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. He's an author, broadcaster on his channel. He also serves on the pastoral staff of 412 Church, San Jacinto, California, formerly under the direction of founder Pastor Tom Hughes. Mark's book we also carry, as we do Mondo's book. Mark's is The Man Code, 12 Essentials Every Man Needs to Know, both in my store. I'm going to be playing some sound bites throughout the hour to illustrate some points. And these will be voices, I think, heavily who disagree with the position of my guests and me. Mark, welcome to the program. Great to be with you, Jan. And Mondo, I'm glad to have you. It's awesome to be here, Jan. Mondo, you are just recovering from an extended trip. Our rep, Ken Michael, was with you, as a matter of fact. Tell me, what happened? Fantastic response in Australia and New Zealand. We really did. It was so great. And again, many of the people that we met love your show and listen to it. And the overwhelming encouragement that we got just as speakers from them, they're hungry. They love the Lord. They love prophecy. They feel alone like many people in the United States do. And they were just so appreciative that we came down and shared the word with them in person. And also for them to fellowship with each other and to see that there was a thousand people at each location, pretty much. So it was an encouraging time of fellowship and teaching. That is so fantastic. And I think you're going to go again sometime in the next year anyway. Is that right? Yeah, based on the reception that we got and the love we got from everybody, we definitely are calling it the Down Under 2.0 trip. Wonderful. Would both of you agree with me in my opening statement there, which took a little bit longer than I had hoped, but I wanted to set the stage that there is confusion about the topic And again, Bible prophecy under siege. It's under siege. There's confusion. The topic of eschatology or the last days. Mark, give me your thoughts in a paragraph, please. The bottom line is everything in the Bible, there's confusion on it. Why? Because Satan is the author of confusion. Now, God speaks clearly. He expects us to read it. The Holy Spirit gives us illumination so we might understand it. All these things are spiritually discerned. That's why you need to trust in Jesus Christ if you haven't, so you can have the Holy Spirit as you're reading the Bible. It'll make more sense. And that's the work of the Spirit of God. But Satan is always trying to distort. He's always trying to twist. You remember when he even tempts Jesus, he's quoting the scriptures and twisting them. And Jan, in fact, it says in 1 Peter 5 that there are false teachers and they distort the things that the Apostle Paul has said under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and it brings destruction to themselves and to others. These things are hard to understand. Peter says that, but he says there's these teachers out there. That was true in the first century. Mm -hmm. It's still true today. Mondo, the attack seems to me to be heavily against what we believe. Premillennial dispensationalism is a long couple of words there. And as Ron Rhodes says in this book, it's his title, Bible Prophecies Under Siege. It seems to me the siege is against people who believe, dare I say, the truth. In other words, there's not a siege, Mondo, against amillennialism, preterism, dominionism, replacement theology, but there is a siege against premillennial dispensationalism, which takes everything literally. Give me your thoughts. That's exactly right. I'm just reminded of Daniel chapter 12. Twice in that passage, Daniel is told to seal up the vision. He asks for clarification, and the angel says, no, Daniel, go your way, but seal up the vision because it's going to be sealed until the time of the end. And so here we are at the time of the end, Yeah. and God is, again, giving it illumination. We look around, Israel's here. It makes a lot of sense. But dispensational premillennial teaching has become very popular. And I think these other groups that have been around for a long time, they don't like it. It's not just because it's popular, but it is making a big headway into the culture because again, we're excited about the Lord's return, but we're also excited about evangelism. So as we know, there is a lot of confusion and the enemy likes to work that through. Some people, Mark, call this, just to have it be easy to understand, left behind theology, because most people have read left behind books. They may not agree with them, but they've read them left behind theology. In other words, it's going to be coming a literal antichrist, a literal tribulation, a literal rapture, a literal second coming, a literal millennium. That sort of sums up what dispensationalism is. Why don't you give your spin on premillennial dispensationalism and why it's being attacked? Anytime you start speaking about the Bible, you're going to be attacked, no matter what happens. The prophets were attacked in the Old Testament. Jesus is attacked. In fact, Jesus is constantly saying, have you not read? We love to teach the traditions of men and the traditions of history, the traditions of the rabbis, or the traditions Mm. of this preacher or that preacher. In fact, we're going to talk about history and the history of dispensationalism in a moment. 
But the bottom line is people want to talk about history instead of the Bible. You start talking about the Bible and taking it in a literal sense, you're going to come up with there is a future tribulation. There is a mm-hmm. real antichrist that's coming. There really is going to be a globalism and a horrible two-thirds of the Jewish people are going to die during these days. That's why my Jewish friends, I'm pleading with them all the yeah. time, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're criticized for believing that. How can you say two-thirds? Because it's in the Bible. That's the bottom line. It's in the Bible. We believe what's in the Bible. So this is really important, Jan. People constantly are attacking. But what does the Holy Spirit say? All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, including the 25% that's prophetic in nature. There is a biblical application for every one of these passages. All prophecy points to Jesus, if you understand it. We are again criticized because those of us who believe this left-behind theology, premillennial dispensationalism, that the rapture is going to rescue us. Well, quite frankly, it is. Here's just a quick clip from, now let me explain this little soundbite, folks. Eric Metaxas is interviewing gentleman author Benjamin Thomas. Thomas has written the book Revelation Riddle. And I'm honestly not attacking Eric here. I actually appreciate a lot of what Eric Metaxas has done. The Bonhoeffer book is unparalleled, Letter to the American Church, book and film coming out. So Eric's done incredible things, and Eric, I know, regrets some of the things that were said. But however, it does demonstrate my point that, gentlemen, we are seen as belonging almost to a cult that's going to get rescued out of here. Therefore, we don't really care what happens to this planet. Nothing could be further from the truth. What I call the rescue rapture has really taken the church and put them on the sideline. People don't, for instance, run for Congress. They don't uh, you know, go to school board meetings. They don't participate in society because they believe that Jesus will come at any moment and rescue them. And I think that's the fruit of this rescue rapture uh, there, doctrine. There's that, one thing I want to tease out of that. There's another piece of that, right? On the one hand, they think Jesus is going to rescue them. On the other hand, there are a lot of people I've met that they're almost psyched to see the world go to hell. They're almost psyched to see everything get worse, like, ha ha, judgment is coming, ha. Instead of being moved by compassion to help those who might be helped, they're, they're kind of glad to see it go downhill. And, and for me, that the United States of America is the classic example that like this country was founded to be a shining city on a hill, to be a beacon of, of liberty, and to be able to be a place, kind of a, almost like a launching pad for gospel missionaries and gospel principles and purposes around the world. And a lot of people who have this rescue, rapture rescue mentality, they're kind of like, nah, we, we're happy to see America go down the tubes. It's already under judgment. It deserves judgment because of all the babies killed and blah, blah, blah. And they're not even slightly patriotic, thinking, what can I do to help my nation uh, stand for God's principles. And they're, they're the ones buying the idea that, oh, yeah, that's Christian nationalism. I'm just about Jesus. Well, that's right. I, in fact, I did a recent survey on my Gab channel where I asked people, does the rapture happen in a time of victory, a time of duress, or I don't know? And 80% of the respondents said a time of duress. And 20% said, I don't know. And not one person said a time of victory. So when you talk about bad things that happen, a lot of Christians are like, yeah, yeah, see, that's it. I told you things will get worse. And they think it's a fulfillment somehow of Bible prophecy. But at the end of the day, it has taken the church out of the game. And that's one of the reasons why we don't have great candidates running for Congress or running for president. That's one of the reasons we find ourselves in a place where Satan has taken over the seven pillars of our society, and then we are shocked. We act shocked, like, oh my gosh, how did that happen? The reason it happened is the Christians were not involved. We thought things were just going to blow up, the world was going to burn up, and so we took a back seat. And I think that's the fruit of that mentality, and and unfortunately, a contributor, not the only contributor, but certainly a contributor to where we are today. Oh, there's no doubt. And listen, part of the joy, you know, when we reconnected, uh, in Phoenix at Amfest, was to hear you say all this stuff from a completely different angle of me, but agreeing with me on where we come out. I mean, it's sort of fascinating because I wasn't looking at the end times part of it, but I was thinking like, we are called 
to be salt and light. We're called to fight, not to sit on the sidelines and, and get the popcorn to watch it all burn. And, you know, like that's not right. And that's bad theology. And that's what led to people accepting the nonsense of like, oh, Christian nationalism, if you care about America. Right? That is total garbage on every level. And what you bring in in this book, and I want to get to the details, is how bad uh, end time theology feeds that and has fed that and has led us to a place where the church has, I mean, imagine what happens when the church pulls the salt and light out of the culture is like it's going to go downhill that much more quickly. So if we bring the salt and light into the culture, if Christians get activated like you and I both pray that they do uh, and advocate that they do, you're going to be stunned if Christians are being active in culture and politics and whatever, you're going to be stunned at the influence we can have. And I believe that's the Lord's will, and you do too. Well, we're the majority, but the fact is we don't fight. Nobody fights. And, and I think a lot of the reason people don't fight is because we've been taught there's no need to. You're going to be raptured out of here. We're going to be rescued. And uh, so this place is going to burn up anyway. And so that's generally what people believe. Now, you know, they may not use those words, but deep down inside, that is what they've been taught, and that's what they believe. There's so much there that I disagree with. I don't know where to begin. Benjamin Thomas, author Revelation Riddle, being interviewed by Eric Metaxas. Mondo, your thoughts? Like you said, Jan, where in the world do we begin on that? These are brothers in the Lord, yes, so we don't speak absolutely. anything negative about them. But here we are traveling across the world to speak to people and to evangelize those. And one of the things that I share on every one of my messages, always at the end in sharing things is, hey guys, there's two verses, Mark 13, 37. This is a command by Jesus that you are to watch. That's a commandment, it's not an option. But the second one I tell them is also a command is in Luke chapter 19, verse 13, where Jesus says, occupy until I come. And so I said, look, hey guys, we know it's coming. We're not rejoicing at evil. But if you don't have a one-year, a five-year, or a 10-year plan for your calling and ministry, whatever that might be, then you're disobeying Jesus's command. So it's interesting to me that this is the classic straw man argument. If we had people in our church that said, oh, great, we're going to be out of here. I can sit around and do nothing. I would be the first one to rebuke them that yeah. that's wrong. But this is typical or sad that you take a small percentage of people who do abuse the doctrine, and then you characterize the rest. Mark Henry, your thoughts, please. I would just say, I've been a pastor now for 34 years. I started preaching Jesus immediately after I trusted Christ 41 years ago, preached my first sermon. I have spent my life advancing the gospel because Jesus is the one who rescues people from the penalty of sin. That's hell. The presence of sin, because we're new creatures in Christ Jesus, and from the presence of sin, that's where we're in his presence. So rescuing is really the message of the Bible. If you want to be rescued, it's not through government. It's not through politics. It isn't by the U.S. government or anyone else, it's by Jesus. So that would be the first thing. Second thing is, if you have a genuine heart for Jesus, you weep over, just yes. like Jesus did, wept over Jerusalem because he knew what was going to befall Jerusalem. And every time I lead a group and we're standing on the Mount of Olives, I look across and I read that passage and we weep because we know what's coming. Just like Noah was told, 120 years, they've got that long to respond. There's only one way of salvation, the ark that God provided. There was plenty of room, but they were not willing and did not recognize the time of the visitation. The third thing I would say is, followers of Jesus, the Great Commission is focused around the gospel. You know, as Americans, we get lulled into this thinking that America is Israel. It's like replacement theology, but America is replacing Israel and not the church. America is not Israel. All the promises to Israel are not promises made to the U.S. Praise God for America. Praise God that we're here. But if you think about the reality is Jesus changes hearts. God created government to suppress evil. And the blessing of America is we've had the opportunity in our constitutional republic to suppress evil like no one else has been able to in history. Now, as that's being unraveled, yes, we should intervene. Jan, you hear me speak on a regular basis, pushing back against the darkness of this society. But the reality is this. My son was going to go into politics. He was going to study Bible for so long, then he was going to study history, and then he was going to go to law school, and he would be in Washington, D.C. My goal as a student was to be the president of the United States right now. But when we saw the power of the gospel, laws cannot make people holy. Laws can suppress evil, and that's what they need to do. That's what government should do, yeah. but Jesus changes everything. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Markell here. Having in the studio, Pastor Mark Henry, Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. 
and also Mondo Gonzalez Prophecy Watchers. Learn more at MarkHenryMinistries.com and ProphecyWatchers.com. And I have these two gentlemen on air today because next week we have our Understanding the Times one-night conference, Thursday, February 22nd, just outside Minneapolis, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Start at 7 p.m., doors open 6 p.m., no cost. You can live stream it anywhere, MarkHenryMinistries.com, MarkHenryMinistries.com. Mark, want to say anything about Apple TV? I want to encourage all of you, have a watch party if you're not here local in the Twin Cities. Literally, we have groups meeting around the world, 73 different countries in the English-speaking world. Jan, it's such a joy to be able to advance the gospel. You can download the Mark Henry Ministry app. You can watch it on Roku, Apple TV. All these other platforms are available. But have a watch party and grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Mondo is going to encourage us in a great way. Yeah, he is, because we know what he's going to talk about. Mondo Gonzalez will be our guest that night, 7 p.m. Central Time, Central Time. And Mondo's written the book, The Red Heifer Ritual, The Last Piece of the Third Temple Puzzle. It's in my online store. And Pastor Mark Henry, your book, The Man Code, is also in my store. That's a little more difficult to define. Give us a sentence on it. The Man Code's essential because how are we going to live in these days? It kind of goes back to what we were just talking about. As followers of Jesus, we need to be devoted. Our lives need to be a reflection of Jesus Christ and His power. And you men, there's 12 essential things that God wants you to know and apply. And you ladies need to help your men along these lines. I'm moving ahead here because there's a lot to talk about in the time that we have left. And I'm inspired by Ron Rhodes' newest book, Bible Prophecy Under Siege, Responding Biblically to Confusion About the End Times. Just going over some basics on eschatology, doctrine of the last days with my two guests. Mark, many people believe that not all of the tribulation is wrath. In other words, we're going to coast through the first few months or even years of that tribulation. That is so wrong. Others believe nothing happens until the sixth seal. My only point in bringing this up is that unspeakable thing is going to happen that entire seven-year tribulation, which is why we're all about rescuing people before that happens. Yeah, Jen, I hear people say that often, and there's obviously a number of books and authors, and some of them are my friends. But the bottom line is this, in Revelation chapter 6, Jesus is in control. He's breaking the seals, and all of them take place because of the wrath of the Lamb. Now, it doesn't use that until we're in the sixth seal, but the application, the reality of it is that the wrath comes from the hand of God. Yes, but it's seven years, correct? Correct, seven years. And there's time signatures in both the book of Daniel, there's time signatures in the book of Revelation, and that whole seven years is a time of tribulation. It's going to be peace with the Antichrist for three and a half years with Israel, but the world's going to be an absolute mess because God's wrath is being dumped out on the earth. And then as Satan is cast from heaven, it says his wrath is going to be poured out through the Antichrist against Israel and against those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ among the Gentile nations. It's going to be something you want to miss. You do want to escape it. Trust in Jesus today. Mondo, I want to play a short clip and get your immediate response to it. What I'm going to play is a trailer from an awful film. It's called Left Behind or Led Astray. Joe Schimmel is the producer and writer of the film. And the point that they're going to emphasize in this minute and a half is that there's not one single verse in the Bible that talks about what Mark just outlined, which would be a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I want to get your perspective on one verse in the Bible talking about this. Left behind or led astray, examining the origins of the secret pre-tribulation rapture features vital end-time insights from prophecy teachers Joe Schimmel, Jacob Prash, and Joel Richardson. The issue of the pre-tribulational versus the post-tribulational rapture is one of the premier pastoral issues of our day. If you're a pastor that's not preparing your people to face potentially the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation in this hour, simply because your denomination teaches it or whatever, personally I think you're failing in your role as a shepherd and a pastor. How is it that the pre-tribulation rapture teaching, which states that Jesus will take the church to heaven before the tribulation, is so popular, even though its leading advocates admit there is not one single verse of scripture that actually teaches this new doctrine? Several pre-trib leaders, say for instance John Walvoord and others, have mentioned that there's not a single verse that clearly teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. I was going to say the same thing. Okay. I don't think there is a single verse that 
that uh, supports the pre-tribulation theory. We offered $10,000 to those holding to a pre-tribulation rapture if they could produce just one verse or passage that states that Jesus will rapture the church before the tribulation. Uh, give me a minute. I can't. No. I don't know where. No. No, I actually can't. No. Um... No, I can't, because it's not in there. If a pre-tribulation rapture is not actually taught in the Bible, where did it originate, and how did it spread among the churches? Mondo Gonzalez, your response to that, please. It's interesting, again, how if you go and ask people questions, I noticed that they were not asking any scholars, any Ron Rhodes or any others. They're asking lay people these questions. But secondly, I would say that the fallacious argumentation here is that I would like to say, can you show me one verse in the Bible that proves the Trinity? True. There isn't a single verse that lays it out that proves the Trinity. I know some people will quote 1 John 5, 7, but that's not in the earlier manuscripts. But apart from that, to sum it up in such a way is such a sleight of hand in reasoning. Secondly, when we think about the rescue and even quoting John Walvoord, John Walvoord, I think that quote is taken out of context. He would say, again, it is true that there's not a single verse that lays it out, again, like the Trinity, but we know that the concept is clearly there. They didn't mention that. We know several times in Scripture, Luke 17, about Noah, about Lot. Those were clearly rescues before the Day of Judgment. Luke 21, Jesus clearly taught that there was a group that could escape and stand before the Son of Man. Revelation 3.10 is very clear that I will remove you before the hour of trial that's coming upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. The second thing I'd like to say there, too, is the comment that as a pastor, if you're not preparing your church to potentially meet the Antichrist, look, how in the world do you do that? There's no manual in the Bible that says, by the way, the Antichrist is coming. This is how you are to survive, store up food. None of that is in there. We know Revelation 13, 7 says that the Antichrist is given authority over the saints, the tribulation saints. He's going to obliterate them. Daniel 7, 21 says the same thing. There is no manual that says, This is how you are to survive the tribulation period. I like to use Revelation 3.10 because you have kept my word of perseverance. I will also keep you from the hour of testing, the hour which is about to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth, which is about to happen in Revelation 4 until nearly the end of that book of the Bible. Mark, your thoughts on this. The Bible simply doesn't talk about a pre-tribulation rapture of the church, which we know it does. It grieves me how emphatic that clip is, because as Mondo pointed out, they asked people on the street, where's there a verse? If you ask the average person walking down the street, where is a verse that says you get to heaven by believing in Jesus? They're probably not going to be able to give you the verse. John Wolverd was quoted not only out of context, but John Wolverd wrote a book. He spent his whole life, by the way, studying the scriptures, obeying the scriptures, living with great godliness and dignity and defending the truth of the scriptures, wrote a book, A Hundred Reasons Why You Should Believe in a Pre-Trib Rapture. Anyways, they mentioned there a second ago about preparing your people to meet the Antichrist. Hello, look through the New Testament. Never are we commanded to do that. We are to help people meet Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. Amen. I'm not sure that the Blessed Hope would be a Blessed Hope if we were preparing to meet the Antichrist. Rapture is called the Blessed Hope because it removes us again, rescues us, from the terrible, terrible agony that's coming on the earth. And not only that, but if you think about the reality that Christians have suffered all through the past, Nero's persecution, yes. the persecution that's happening right now in Nigeria, for example, Amen. of Christians. How do you prepare them? You help them draw near to the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. All your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. These are the things that strengthen people in times of persecution. To say that eschatology or premillennialism, pre-tribulationalism somehow degrades that, they're missing the point. We are basing our discussion, slightly anyway, let's just say I've prepared the hour because I've read Dr. Ron Rhodes' newest book. It's in my store, Bible Prophecy Under Siege, Responding Biblically to Confusion About the End Times, Dr. Ron Rhodes. Olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org, and just go to my store, call my office, get on our newsletter lists. You'll see this featured prominently now, I would say for the next six months or so. And after reading it and being stirred by it, I came up with an outline for today and invited Mondo Gonzalez again. He is our guest, Understanding the Times, which would be the winter here, 2024, on Thursday, February 22nd at Pastor Mark Henry's church, Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, 
address for that? 7849 West Broadway, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Doors are going to open at 6 p.m., but you can live stream it. Most of you, 95%, you're out of the area. Live stream it, markhenryministries.com, markhenryministries.com. Mondo will be our guests, and we do post it all the various places about a day to two days later. And Mondo is the co-host of the very popular TV program, Radio 2, I think, and that would be Prophecy Watchers. Say, gentlemen, we've got some current events. I don't want to totally overlook them, and particularly a very intriguing story that's hit big time online, and that is that the Hamas war is really about the Third Temple. And more specifically than that, about the four red cows, the holy cows. Let me play just a very quick clip that's going to introduce this topic and explain it a little bit. Because Mondo has written a book about the third temple and those holy cows. And I just want to address this to both of my in-studio guests. Hey folks, Yishai on guard duty here. You know, when you listen to Hamas, they keep saying that this whole thing is about Al-Aqsa. It's, they call it the Al-Aqsa Flood. It's all about the Temple Mount. And they keep putting symbols uh, of the Golden Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. And recently, uh, a Hezbollah spokesman said one of the reasons they started this war is because uh, Israel brought these five red heifers. And they are totally afraid that we're going to build the Third Temple. Okay, so there's two ways to go with that. One way is to be like, no, 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 we don't mean it. When It's not about a third temple. You have it all wrong. We actually wanted to stay an Islamic site up there and limit Jews from praying. And we should definitely just, you know, stay quiet. And we didn't mean it. And you misunderstood. And these red heifers are just for viewing. That's one way to handle it. Another way to handle it is to say, we are not here just to get our captives back. We're not here to just secure the South and secure the North. We're about a third temple. That's what this period's about. And Jerusalem is our capital, not your capital. And when we let them say it's their capital, then they draw the word Palestine over the whole of Israel. And they put the the mosque right in the middle and they'd say, this this is our symbol that we're going to take the whole land. We got to be like, no, you won't take the land. The Temple Mount will be a house of prayer for all nations. Yes, but the control will be Israel. And yes, we are aiming for a third temple. Try that sometime. Somebody accuses you of wanting a third temple, be like, yeah. Yeah, that's what we're really about. It's true. That's what Israel's really about. It's about something much bigger than just defense and just <clears throat> having a nice and decent life. It's really about a third temple. In the end, that's what we want. How it's going to come, I don't know. But it's certainly going to come through the defeat of Hamas and Hezbollah and the jihadist forces. Those forces are anti-God, anti-good, and anti-Jewish, and anti-world. And the temple in Jerusalem is exactly the opposite. It's a light to the world. It's an opportunity for the world to come together through truth and through a value system that lights up the world and doesn't darken it. So next time somebody says to you, you guys want to build a third temple, just say, yeah, we do. What's wrong with that? Mondo Gonzalez, you've written the book, The Red Heifer Ritual, the last piece of the third temple puzzle. Talk to us, please, about this. This has been really interesting because I had heard rumors about that even early on several comments that were made by Hamas. And then to have this writing come out where it was confirmed that one of the reasons why they attacked was watching since September 15th of 2022, when the five red cows were flown from Texas. So they recognize what's happening inside Israel and that the movement to bring a temple on the Temple Mount is building. We know from scripture, of course, several passages that it will happen. And one of the prerequisites for that, according to at least the Jewish rabbis and the idea of a purity standpoint, is that a red heifer would be offered on the Mount of Olives. Here we are watching all this. And interestingly, I reached out to Byron Stenson just recently from Bonet Israel because there's a lot of confusion as it relates to the status of the cows. Even on the Temple Institute Facebook page, they're saying, no, there's only three cows that are still qualified. Well, I reached out to him yesterday. He said, no. There are four cows still qualified. He would know. He was part of the original rancher. He found them. And so he knows that there's four that are there. And he also told me that they are still determined to have the ceremony on the Mount of Olives around Passover, which is April 22nd, through Shavuot, which happens in June of this year. So we're entering this window where we do have, for the first time in the last 1900 years, the history, at least of the church age, that four red cows are qualified to be slaughtered. They are of age. They came of age in November. So that is still true. 
You can find that book in my online store, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org. Mark, your thoughts on this, and you gave me some fascinating insight before the program about the temple and things surrounding the temple. One thing we know for sure, Daniel 9 and Revelation 11, there's going to be a third temple built, and it's going to be around throughout the tribulation period. And that 40 acres has always been contested. That's the most contested piece of property in the world. Satan wants to keep control of it. But I had a group over there not long ago, and we were with an Israeli guide, doesn't know Jesus, is not a religious Jew, a secular Jew, like many of my Jewish friends are. And I could tell our excitement about the possibility of the temple being rebuilt put fear in this guide. And it dawned on me as we were talking and walking through, and so many folks in our group were talking about the temple. Aren't you excited about this? Aren't you excited? They're not excited, and the reason is their children are the ones who are going to die when the temple's built. There's going to be conflict over this. And it shouldn't surprise us there's conflict because God's got a plan. God's telling us history is moving in a certain way. Satan is going to oppose that. Hamas is definitely wanting to oppose that, but they're not going to stand and have triumph over what God has determined for history in Israel. Another pastor's huddle coming up June 4th, 5th, and 6th. We offer two to three days of specialized teaching on eschatology with Dr. Mike Powell, formerly Dallas Seminary. And this will be our third event with pastors coming from across the nation. Find info on our website, olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org, or call my office. This is co-sponsored by Mark Henry Ministries, Revived Church in Minneapolis, and Olive Tree Ministries. June 4th, 5th, 6th in suburban Minneapolis. Contact us for details. In previous sessions, Dr. Powell has taught on the book of Daniel and Revelation, equipping pastors to teach these books of the Bible. And Mark, the times of your church services in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota are? Jan, actually, we have seven services, four here in the Midwest, two out in the West Coast. Here in the Midwest, 4 p.m. on Saturday, Sunday mornings, 8 a.m., 9.30 and 11 o'clock. And then on the West Coast, they're at 4.12, 8.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And by the way, if I can only speak for Twin Cities and your Sunday, 8 and 9.30 happens to be traditional music, which lots of people are looking for. And folks, there's nothing like it in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Thank you, Carissa, for what you present every Sunday. I want to hit a little bit here on, again, this is current events, and I'm still staying in the theme of Bible prophecy under siege. And a gentleman who calls what we believe to be a foul and a stray would be the so-called Bible answer man, Hank Canegraaff. I just want to play a quick clip of him because I can tell you, and by the way, Hank, I believe he's a preterist, which all prophecy happened in 70 AD, a partial preterist, a full preterist does not even believe Jesus Christ is returning, but a partial preterist believes just about everything of prophetic nature happened in 70 AD. I'll say more about that in just a moment. But here's the really troubling thing is how they disinherit Israel. Israel has no role whatsoever. And the real enemies of today would be not just Israel, but her benefactors, her defenders, Christian Zionists. Hank, I can debate a number of issues, doctrines, with uh, different uh, professing Christians and not be ad hominem attacked for my position. But when it comes to my biblical response to Christian Zionism, ad hominem attacks seem to be common. And sometimes, in fact, Hank, it seems to me that, that these individuals have more dislike for those that they deem anti-Semites because of opposition to Zionism than to those who are admittedly anti-Christ. So my question is this, you know, why must I agree with a dispensationalist or be attacked as an anti-Semite whose views are going to bring about another Holocaust? Yeah, it's quite ironic, really, when you think about it, and I certainly have experienced this myself. Let, let, let Christians question the notion of a uh, pre-tribulational rapture followed by a Holy Land Holocaust in which the vast majority of Jews perish, and they're immediately shouted down as peddlers of godless heresy. In fact, popular dispensationalists are blunt in their denunciations. Uh, I've been called a replacement theologian carrying Hitler's anointing in his message. But the irony of this is, first of all, Uh, The position that we take is not replacement at all. We're saying that Christ has only had one chosen people, one covenant community, beautifully connected by the cross and illustrated by the Apostle Paul by a cultivated olive tree. One does not replace the other. It actually is in 
the dispensational worldview that one replaces the other, which is to say the church gets raptured and then Israel becomes the focus of God's attention and that focus is not particularly bright. It's very bloody. Uh, Two-thirds of the Jews that are now herded in the Holy Land are going to be killed in a bloodbath unprecedented in human history. If you hear the descriptions as given by Tim LaHaye in Left Behind, they're simply stunning. I wrote about this in the Apocalypse Code. Find out what the Bible really says about the end times and why it matters today. So it's ironic that the very people that are herding Jews into the Holy Land, knowing that they're going to be bludgeoned to death in a bloody massacre, are the ones that are calling uh, other people anti-Semites. It simply doesn't make any common sense. But what it is, is it's a conversation stopper, which is to say that the minute that moniker is enunciated, it stops all conversation. No one wants to be called anti-Semitic. Right. And, and certainly to be anti-Semitic would be a horrific evil. But there is no sense whatsoever in that uh, this can, in, in which this can be uh, pinned on someone that disagrees with the replacement theology of dispensationalists. So a preterist and some other preterists, Hank Hanegraaff is one, R.C. Sprawl, Gary DeMar, Gary North, Ken Gentry, some, not all, but some within the Reformed theology stream. Again, not all. No role for Israel today. Let me just grab something from Gary DeMar's website. It's a big headline. This was a few years ago. Jan Markell's End Time Hysteria Conference. Big article. Once again, the usual suspects are gathering at Grace Church, Eden Prairie, to tell an eager and naive audience that all the signs are aligned for an inevitable end time event. And he goes on to say, I suspect the majority of attendees who sit under Mark Hitchcock, Jan Markell, Ron Rhodes, he names some others, will not realize that only the names, events, and dates have changed. They will be hearing regurgitated prophetic speculation in the name of the Bible. That's on Gary DeMar's website probably five years ago or so. Mondo Gonzalez, my position is that one cannot, simply cannot, understand the times if they're going to not fully understand the situation in the Middle East, even as we speak, as we just heard Mr. Hanegraaff say, but there's only one chosen people. In other words, there's no role for Israel today. And then by default, why do we even care what's happening as I speak in God's land? Mondo, your thoughts? Where do we begin on something like this? Because look, I'm a gentle soul. I don't want to call anybody names, ad hominem attacks on either side. But the fact of the matter, there's a lot of confusion in what Hank has said. I used to listen to Hank all the time. So when he speaks about Jehovah's Witnesses, I like that. But here he gets it completely wrong because to associate us as a dispensational thinker that we are endorsing the idea. We're not coming up with this ourselves. Jesus himself in the Oliva Discourse said this would be a time of trouble that has never existed in the history of the world. Those aren't our words. It's Zechariah 13, which talks about two-thirds of the Jews. And again, we're not embracing it. We're not endorsing it. We're not liking it. We're just simply saying, this is what the scripture says. It's no different if you go and read Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is talking about the judgment of Judah and how they're going to be taking away to Babylon. Jeremiah wept over it, but he didn't endorse it. And so in the same way, when we think about partial preterism, I have some friends who are partial preterists, as probably many of us do, and they are confused about what's going on in the world, the idea of globalism and a cashless society right. and tyranny, and especially as it relates to Israel, they have no clue. They have no way to grasp and to put things into context because for them, everything was fulfilled in AD 70. There's a future return of Jesus. But other than that, their non-literal hermeneutic allows them to spiritualize everything away and they end up in all kinds of crazy places. Pastor Mark Henry, your thoughts, please. That's a horrible mistake to attack us who believe in a pre-trib, pre-mill position and say that we're not being historical. Here's the reality of what Hank misses. History bears this fact that those who believe in replacement theology, that the church somehow replaces Israel or is a fulfillment of all the promises to Israel, end up in a position, as far as denominations go, and history is filled with illustrations of it, being anti-Semitic. The Catholic True. Church is anti-Semitic. If right. you haven't been to Yad Vashem yep. and walk through Yad Vashem, I'm going to be talking about this at the Prophecy Watcher conference in Florida. When you go to Yad Vashem, you understand the reality of what replacement theology does in the Catholic Church. You can show it in the Lutheran movement. You can show it in other reform movements. Anyone that ends up embracing that, because 
They don't have a literal historical grammatical interpretation to prophecy. They replace Israel. In other words, they start moving around the scriptures as they want. And can I just simply say this, Jan, what we've found in the last couple of years, and I warned people, once you leave a literal historical grammatical interpretation in one area, whether it's Genesis 1 or Revelation, it'll affect every other area of theology. Groups that are intrinsically moving or hold to a replacement theology position because of their hermeneutic are prone to embrace wokeism, yeah, globalism, right. the digital currency. In our city, the churches that have held to that are more prone to that that's because right. they've left a literal hermeneutic. Mondo, would you give us a commercial, please, for your Prophecy Watchers conference coming up end of the month here? Give us the dates, where it is, and how they can attend or stream. February 29th through March 3rd, we're going to have over 18 speakers there in Orlando, Florida. People can go to orlandoprophecysummit.com. We are sold out in person, but as many people can't make it, you certainly can go there and find out about our live streaming option. It's going to be a great time. There's no doubt. Again, as Mark said, he's going to be there. We love having everybody's favorites as much as possible into one hallway. And the fellowship and the ability to hang out and talk is just incredible. Can they find out more also at prophecywatchers.com? Yes, they can. Prophecywatchers.com. And the dates again for the live stream, Mondo, would be? February 29th through March 3rd. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Markell here. Have in the studio, Pastor Mark Henry, Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, and also Mondo Gonzalez, Prophecy Watchers. Mondo is our guest, Pastor Mark Henry, and my guest for Understanding the Times, winter, and that would be next week, Thursday, February 22nd. We hold it at Revived Church, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, 7849 West Broadway. Doors open 6 p.m., program 7 to 9 p.m., roughly. We do start promptly at 7 p.m. Central, always Central Time. You can stream it, MarkHenryMinistries.com in your app. Yeah, if you're going to stream online, you can do it at MarkHenryMinistries.com. Download the Mark Henry Ministry app. You can see it on Roku. You can see it on your Apple TV, all those other platforms. We're looking forward to having you. And you can learn more on the Olive Tree Ministries app as well, folks. Or watch it a day, a week, or a month later if you want. My website, YouTube, Rumble, MarkHenryMinistries.com, etc., Gentlemen, our time is winding down, so let me just hit a few more bullet points here before our time runs out. I've based the hour on Dr. Ron Rhodes' book, Bible Prophecy Under Siege. I believe it is under siege big time. How do you think, Mark Henry, it got this way? Is it church growth movement, secret sensitive movement? Pastors see it as too gloomy. They don't get it, the education in seminary. How did it happen? Jan, I think when you look back in history, the historical perspective is Augustine writes City of Our God, and then there's a trajectory change in how we interpret prophecy in Christendom, not Mm -hmm. Christians, but Christendom. And that has continued on ever since the fourth century. What's very interesting, at the time of World War I, World War II, we thought that was the end of the world, and you had a lot of people focused on prophecy. Israel becomes a nation. This is a super sign that has to take place, if you will, for the book of Revelation, for Daniel to be fulfilled. So people were kind of focused. And then you had these great servants of God, like Dr. Ryrie and Dr. John Wolvert and Dr. Pentecost, and they were all traveling around the country and speaking on that. I think what happened as those guys were passing off the scene, there were some people that came on Mm. and they started setting dates. Generation won't pass away. Israel starts in 1948. 1988 1988 will be the end of it. 1988, that's it. So then, wow, these are all date setters. John Wolvard never said that. Ryrie never said that. The scholars never said that. But there were other people that said that. And so we bear the rap of that. Mm. And then with those men passing away, just like anything, the next generation of leaders at different seminaries and so forth stopped holding to a literal historical grammatical Mm. interpretation. They want their schools to be bigger. Right now, denominations are wanting to include more people. There's very few of them. But if they did hold to a dispensational perspective, now they want to drop that so they can have more pastors because we're going to run out of pastors. And so we're going to bring in these reform guys and we're all going to be happy and we're going to be intellectuals. Friends, theology is not just an intellectual thing. It's a heart thing. It's a matter of obedience Mm. to Jesus Christ. Take the scriptures in a literal, historical, grammatical interpretation, all of it, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Mondo, Pastor Mark Henry just cited in part The kook factor, the Harold Campings out there setting dates, ridiculous dates, all the time. Give me your thoughts on how did this happen? That's exactly the case. And as is typical sometimes, again, in wrong thinking is you go find the most kookiest person that would embrace that, and then you use them as the poster child in order to attack it. It's a straw man argument. 
This is, again, the abuse. There's an abuse of every doctrine. I mean, you could preach righteousness, and then that leads into legalism, right? So we understand that a mature Christian is balanced in handling Scripture. And it's the same way when we study eschatology, that we recognize a literal hermeneutic that all the prophecies of Jesus' first coming, even all of them, Hank Hanegraaff and all of them, the Reformers, they understood that when Micah 5.2 says Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, it wasn't spiritual, it was literal, mm -hmm. that he'd be pierced. All those are literal, but somehow in the middle, well, we know it was fourth century with the allegorical school down in Alexandria, Augustine and others, they changed the rules because of the Roman Empire. They began to change it to be, again, more allegorical. And that's been the history yeah. of the church since the fourth century. So today, most of the denominations, seminaries, they have gone worldly. You think about Harvard and Yale and others that were started to train pastors. They're very far from that today. I think it's just a sign of the end that we know in First Timothy 4 that in the latter days, many will depart from the faith. So we know this is coming. We know this is here. But I spend so much time on hermeneutics. How do we interpret Scripture? Because that really is the key. As soon as you go non-literal, again, the sky's the limit. And I think that is the largest contributing factor as well as what Jesus said in John 12, 43, many people love the praises of men rather than the praises of God. And so what we see in church growth movements is how do we be like the world to win them? And then it just leads into all the rest. So much of what we're talking about here, they do not take the Bible, at least eschatology-wise, they don't take it literally. They allegorize, they spiritualize so much. Amillennial is spiritualized, preterist spiritualized. Go ahead, Mark. Can I give an illustration of yeah, that, Jan? Please do. I was debating a guy. He came to our church. He was ordained with a major line denomination. He was a follower of Jesus, and we'd have these wonderful discussions. And then we started focusing on eschatology. Hmm. We'd have these long debates, and I realized debating without a text to focus on, we would never get anywhere. So I just started picking scriptures. He's a post millennialist He believed that we're in the kingdom right now. And so I just wow. turned to Revelation. It says, Satan is bound for the thousand yeah. years. Is Satan bound right now? He goes, well, yeah, Satan's bound right now. And I said, no, he's not. What does it say in Peter? He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. How can you say he's bound when we see him attacking and we're supposed to be watchful and alert and obey the scriptures? Then I said, Abraham has promised this piece of property from the great river of Egypt all the way to the Euphrates. And it says in Acts chapter 7, he didn't receive one square foot. So did God lie? Oh, Mark, 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 you don't understand. Christians own land all around the world and it's bigger than that piece of property. This is what we mean by not taking it literal. Thank you. Again, we've been basing some of our discussion from the new Ron Rhodes book, In My Store, Bible Prophecy Under Siege. And I'm almost out of time. I don't want this topic to go unaddressed. So, Mondo, let me start with you. Everything we believe was started by John Nelson Darby in 1830. It never even existed before 1830. You and I, Pastor Henry here, realize that is complete and utter nonsense. Mondo, give it two minutes, please, why this is nonsense. It is amazing to me how we can answer this accusation a thousand times and it just refuses to that die. Is, that is right. I would say this too, that that question is, well, that's not found in church history. Well, that doesn't determine theology, whether it's historical or not. That might have an interesting part to play because if we go back to the time of the Reformation, this was exactly the claim that was made by the Catholic Church against the Reformers who had rediscovered the idea that we are saved by grace through faith alone. And so that same argument was used against them. And the reformers said, again, the question isn't, is it historical? The question is, is it biblical? And so people have to be very careful in using that accusation because we know, first of all, if you go back to the early history of the church, and many have done this, William Watson in his book, Dispensationalism for Darby, it's a great book. He goes back to the reformers in England, showing how they believed in a preacher rapture, Certainly, Dr. Tommy Ice has written about this, yes. finding church historians going back to the fourth century. Lee Brainerd, if people don't know his work, he is on a mission looking at all the untranslated Greek manuscripts, and he's finding all of these pre-trib things that go all the way back, again, to the third and fourth centuries. Even John Gill in his 1748 commentary is talking about being rescued prior, and he's a Calvinist, I and mean, he's a Reformed guy. So the people that say this, they're just ignorant. It's not a mean thing I'm saying. They're just uninformed about the true history that this doctrine, it originates with Paul and it originates with Jesus. Amen. Mark, you want to address that? You've got a minute to do so. The bottom line is this. I believe in solo scriptura. It doesn't matter what happens in history. It matters what happens in the Bible, what the Bible states, what Jesus said, what the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit's recorded in the book of Revelation. 
And Jan, just the bottom reality is we can quote person after person who believes in the coming of Jesus to be literal and visible, which is very important when you're addressing a preterist. When you're dealing with a partial preterist, the reality is there's all kinds of people in history. And I just love the quote from Increase Mathis. He was a prominent pastor in New England. He became the president of Harvard College in 1685. In 1701, this is long before Darby, which is the argument, the historical argument, mm-hmm. says this, when Christ comes, believers will see the king in all of his glory and go with him to heaven. Christ assured believers it shall be thus. John 14, 2, they will sit together with him in heavenly places. Later, they shall come down from heaven. They shall be with him when he comes in judgment to the world. There's the taking. There's the judgment. We come back with Jesus, just like it describes in Revelation, if you took it in literal historical grammatical interpretation by someone who's 100 years before, the president of Harvard. These things are not new. They're found in the Bible. Gentlemen, thank you for spending the hour with me today. Mondo Gonzalez, we are so looking forward to seeing you on Thursday evening, February the 22nd, here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We've had, throughout the winter, Mondo, we're warming it up for you, 50 degrees occasionally this winter. I can't promise, though. I just can't promise. God had me live in Chicago for nine years, so I'm used to a little bit of the cold, so hopefully I'll be tough enough to survive whatever the Lord allows. It'll be 7 p.m. Central Time. Doors open 6 p.m. Live stream. MarkHenryMinistries.com will be about a two-hour program that night with Mondo, Pastor Mark Henry, and yours truly. Let me just go out of the program here today saying that the Bible gives us just one assignment as last days Christians, and that is to occupy until he comes. To occupy includes spreading the gospel. We're to be encouraging those who are discouraged. We're to be caring for one another. We're to be engaging in spiritual warfare now more intense than at any other time in history. But in spite of circumstances, I always like to go out reminding you to look back and thank him, to look around and serve him, to look ahead and trust him, always looking up and expecting him. He is coming again. I want to thank you for listening, and we will talk to you again next week. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, Five five three one one. That's box one four five two, Maple Grove, Minnesota, five five three one one. All gifts are tax deductible. The psalmist says that our times are in His hands. We know that His eye is on the sparrow, and be assured that you are engraved on the palm of His hands. Yeah.